So, let's make a barbarian soap glass. Izuka Midoriya, Deku, the inheritor of the powerful quirk called One for All. Welcome to My Wife is the MC. I'm DMV and you're watching Husbando Homebrew. This is a show where I take pop culture icons from anime, movies, or video games and translate them into 5th edition D&D homebrew content. In this show, we take an OP broken character and make broken mechanics. Before we begin, I want to impress upon you that this is very, very, very 0% unlikely to be legal in AL and it's something you'd probably have to bring up to your DM. Second, I'd like to give a brief overview on my thought process. As much as I can, I want to provide only official material or unearthed arcana published by Wizards of the Coast, if only to keep it easier to manage the uh, many sources. As for my priorities, I like to focus first and foremost on the narrative anchor, which is my fancy term for a homebrew feature's story element. Where does it place in the world or setting? Then I focus on ease of use and fun factor. After all, a homebrew feature is only as good as its ability to keep the flow of the game intact. Gotta keep that pace going. Lastly, I'll give a fleeting glance at balance. Uh, yes, game balance is not that high on my list, and let's face it, these first version mechanics are likely gonna break any hope of game balance. Why do you think I prefer to run single player games? Hmm? Hmm? In any case, if you're a DM who is willing to try this out, know that you'll need to counterbalance my homebrew features yourself. Maybe comment down below if you want to see how I do monster sad blocks like a normal. Kidding aside, that doesn't mean I'm completely on board with absurd power levels. Just know that my priority is keeping the narrative element first and then think of game balance later. Part 1. Fighting Style I'm kind of an anime only fan from My Hero Academia, but from what I've seen so far, Deku's fighting style is mostly tears and hand to hand combat. He's had a preference for punching, well, flicking, and only learned to kick harder later on in the series. Boy needs to watch more Kamen Rider if you ask me. Unless I'm mistaken, his fighting style doesn't seem to be anything particularly special, unlike Loki best boy and Sue Storm enthusiast, yes I ship it, Mashirao Ojiro, who seems to be a legit martial artist with the power of tail. I'm kidding, I love him and there isn't enough of him on screen. So as a baseline, Deku likely has the unarmed fighting style or rather, unarmed fighting, fighting style, which we can find in page 42 of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Let's read what it does. So if you're gonna build him without any homebrew stuff, you're gonna wanna get this fighting style. Probably. Now that we've got the preliminary parts out of the way, let's move on to... Part 2. Possible Build. Here's the bit where we get a bit more technical. Quirks in general are inborn and tend to cater towards a customized beast race, like a modified grung race for Loki best girl Froppy, or an asshole race with a pyromancer sorcerer from Plane Shift Kaladesh for Bakugo. For Deku, however, his powers come from an external source. It's easy to think of Deku as a variant human berserker barbarian, given that his power comes in small bursts and it takes a toll on his body. But if you think about it, He's kind of making a pact with the previous holders of One for All, especially since his predecessors are beginning to reach out to him. His super jump, for example, is the ascendant step invocation, and his finger flicking thing is kind of like an eldritch blast that he didn't pick up until he reached 4th level. Even his smash attacks early in the series are reminiscent of a hexblade using his UNLIMITED SPELL SLOTS to use eldritch smite on an unarmed strike. Okay, I get it, the analogy breaks down since Eldritch Smite is only used on a pack weapon and OFA isn't really into the whole deal for power thing. But I really just wanted to illustrate how flexible you can be when translating characters into character sheets. So with that, do we even need to make something new for Deku? Can we settle for some Barbarian or Warlock build? Technically yes. But then this show wouldn't have any janky weirdness you're probably here for, so let's take this EVEN FURTHER BEYOND and make something new. Part 3. What kind of homebrew? So first is, what kind of feature will we make for Deku? My go-to for recreating fictional character abilities is through a race or a magic item. But Deku's powers manifest physically, but he got it later in life. In fact, he had to train hard before swallowing an old man's tuft of hair. Oh boy. Uh, uh, we could make an argument that Deku's race goes from quirkless human 
to a quirky human hair consumer, but that doesn't give us enough wiggle room to account for his power creep. I'm actually tempted to make a boon uh, coming from Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes, but again, we don't want to scope creep the F out of something small. So, let's make a barbarian subclass. Okay, okay, look. I know I made the case of Deku being a pacted warlock, but one for all is also pretty narratively close to Path of the Ancestral Guardian, but without the self-inflicted broken bones. I wanted to make this one a barbarian subclass, cause it's simple enough compared to the other subclasses, and the main class features pretty much account for majority of OFA's power set anyway. Few caveats though! I'll try and cover as much as I know about what Deku has in terms of his power set with One For All. I know, I know, what's currently in canon is probably not even scratching the surface, but we gotta work with what we have. Also, the 14th level feature has a spoiler in it, so if you're anime only like me and you're not like me who had to get spoiled silly to make a YouTube video, then I will let you know when you need to drop off in order to keep manga spoilers off your pure innocent soul. Part 4. Path of the Successor I'm calling this Path of the Successor because 1. it sounds cool and 2. I think it encompasses what this subclass is about. Descriptive text of features are often overlooked, but when creating homebrew content, this text is integral to establishing the narrative anchor and serves as a framework to give succeeding features a sense of consistency. Let's have Discount VA All Might describe this for us. Ha 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 ha! I am here! One for all is a transferable quirk that can be passed on from one user to the next. The first person cultivates the power and then passes it on to another. The next refines it and passes it on again. In this way, those crying out to be saved and those with brave and true hearts link to form a crystalline network of power. I am so sorry. But anyway, barbarians who take on this responsibility can draw out the power of their predecessors to persevere through desperate situations by going even further beyond. This strength, however, comes at a cost. The arcane lines that carve jagged paths against their body shows the pain they must endure to carry such power. Level 3 Features So, level 3, the main meat of the subclass. Most of the time, barbarians get one subclass feature at third level, but there are times where the subclass has two, such as Path of the Wild Surge from Tasha's Cauldron of Please wizards, don't make 6th edition yet, I'm trying to make a living out of this. Let's start with the first subclass feature, Smash! Beginning at 3rd level, you can draw out the power of your quirk once during your turn. When you use Reckless Attack as part of making a melee weapon attack, you can cast the Thunder Wave spell using your Constitution as your spellcasting ability for the spell. You cast the spell at a level equal to your proficiency bonus. Alternatively, immediately before you make a long jump or high jump, you can cast the Jump spell on yourself, which lasts until the end of your current turn. Either spells can also be cast in this way while raging. When you do so, you take bludgeoning damage to yourself, equal to the thunder damage you rolled or the distance you traveled from your jump. You can choose to forgo this damage by expending one use of your rage. So, it's pretty much balanced- oh who am I kidding? Right off the bat, this is fairly unbalanced, strong, and it's technically two features in one. Uh, I required Reckless because at this level, Deku is still learning to control OFA, and anything he does pretty much breaks an arm or a leg. The Thunder Wave spell also counts for that shockwave effect that he does whenever he draws it out. Of course, we can't very well use 100% of OFA all the time, self damage or no, because that will just bust the game balance of this subclass way, way out the gate at early levels. Basically, much like Deku, the intent is to end the fight before you end yourself. Also, even at higher levels, he still requires Reckless, if only because drawing it out is such a huge risk-reward kind of play. You might ask, DMV, does this mean you can do this with weapons? Um, technically yes. While OFA users have been historically fistfighters, I don't see how this can't apply to weapon users as well. This is why we have the 
fighting style unarmed fighting referenced early in this video. You might also ask, so this means if I hit, I deal the attack damage then Thunder Wave? Yes, that is intentional. It's the screw all of you but <coughs> this one person in particular attack. You might notice that there is a soft resource in the form of the rage usage. The intent is to showcase how much bodily control is needed to control one for all. Deku has done so before, where he took so much damage to himself rather than take the time and concentration just to end the fight faster. You might also ask, how come you can do this without raging? Well, I figure rage comes into play to mitigate that bludgeoning damage and to give the barbarians a chance to use that chonkers d12 hit die. Level 6 Features Moving on to level 6, we get Full Cow. Beginning at 6th level, you can draw out manageable amounts of power from one for all for extended periods of time. While you're raging, you gain the following benefits. First, your speed increases by 5 feet. Second, you gain the ability to move along vertical surfaces without falling during the move. Third, the first time you hit on each of your turns with a weapon attack, deals extra damage equal to half your barbarian level rounded up. Fourth, you gain a new attack option that you can use with the attack action by firing a burst of concentrated air from your hand. This special attack is a range attack with a range of 30 feet. You are proficient with it and you add your strength modifier to its attack and damage rolls. Its damage is bludgeoning and its damage die is 1d6. To be honest, I was tempted to add magical damage to your attacks at this level, similar to that of a monk's, but at this point, I kinda already pissed all over level 9 monks by giving a vertical scaling ability and even a bit of the Zealot Barbarian's Divine Fury. Speaking of monks, I also swiped the Sun Soul Monk's Radiant Sunbolt with the Air Burst attack. The only caveat is that it can only be used while raging and it's not the most exciting in terms of damage. Level 10 Features Ah oh boy, the subclass is already so front-loaded, so we'll take a small breather with the Ribbon ability. For this one, I'll swipe the theme of the Ancestral Guardian Barbarian with a feature I call Consult the Predecessors. At 10th level, you gain the ability to consult with the previous users of One for All. When you do so, you cast the Commune spell without using a spell slot or material components. Wisdom is your spellcasting ability for this spell. After you cast the spell in this way, you can't cast it again until you finish a long rest. So, quite simple, have a chat with your OFA senpais, avatar style. The only issue here is that the DM has to know what the previous users know, you know? Level 14 Features And now, for the subclass capstone, the coveted 14th level feature is well, a spoiler for anime-only fans, so if you don't want to get spoiled, this is where we part ways. But do feed the algorithm for me and come back once you've caught up. Please. So, have they all left? It's just the manga readers and or spoiler-resistant viewers here? Cool, not gonna lie, I spoiled myself too. So at 14th level, you get Assimilated Quarks. Beginning at 14th level, you can use the abilities of your predecessors. When you enter Rage or as a bonus action on your turn while Raging, you can cast one of the following spells granted by one of your predecessors. Hikage Shinomori. You can use the fourth user's quirk to cast Fortune's Favor on yourself. Daigoro Banjo. You can use the fifth user's quirk to cast the spell Maximilian's Earthen Grasp. N. You can use the sixth user's quirk to cast the Fog Cloud spell. Nana Shimura. You can use the seventh user's quirk to cast the Levitate spell on yourself. When you cast that spell with this trait, you do so requiring no material components. Constitution is your spellcasting ability for these spells. If a spell requires concentration, you can cast it without needing to concentrate on it. The spell ends early if you become incapacitated or if you exit out of rage. When you cast any one of these spells, you can't do so again until the next time you enter rage. So there are two more unknown quirks as far as I'm aware, meaning DMs can add to this as Boku proceeds with the story. Admittedly, it's not that future-proof since Midoriya might develop some OP powers near the end of the manga. Can't say, really. 
Balance-wise, it's actually not that bad. Uh, certainly more balanced than the 3rd and 6th level features. Also, it's nice that there are existing 5e e spells that can somewhat match the quirks of the previous users. Certainly saved me a lot more time. Part 5. Final Thoughts If I hadn't made it clear yet, my intention was to keep it as close to the source as possible in terms of mechanical theme and gameplay. I certainly don't believe it to be balanced compared to other official Barbarian subclasses, but I don't think it's too overblown either. Uh, hopefully. Either way, now's your chance to agree, disagree, or give your own take on the features down in the comments below. If this is your first time here, this channel does homebrew D&D content and even has an ongoing single-player campaign set in a homebrew Gundam setting. Do feed the hungry algorithm with your likes and subscribes, and let us know in the comments if you want to see more. If you want to support the channel, well, we're a little too small for Patreon, but we do have a Ko-Fi. There, you'll find a PDF link to Path of the Successor. Well, good job on making it here at the end. Thank you for being here, and we doubly appreciate any engagement you throw our way. This has been My Wife is the MC. I'm DMV, and I'll see you in the next Husbando Homebrew.